This is North Korea testing out their new train launched missile. This is China also testing a new missile. This is Russia testing out their new hypersonic cruise missile. And this is the United States testing out their hypersonic missile. So in this video, I'm gonna explain in plain and simple terms so anyone can understand what is a missile, why does it matter, and why are all these militaries building all these missiles up? So in other words, this is rocket science made simple. In the news, you'll hear almost interchangeably the terms missile and rockets, but do you know the difference? Most missiles work on the same principles as rockets do, and in a prior video, we talked about the basics of rocket propulsion. In that video, I explained the basic principles of what a rocket is and how it works. So if you're interested, make sure you check that out after this video. But like I said, in this video, we're gonna be focusing on missiles. So we're not gonna talk about the basics of rocketry. Essentially, most missiles are rockets, but not all rockets are missiles. Just like a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't necessarily a square. Are you confused yet? It's much more simple than it sounds. A rocket is defined as a projectile or a vehicle that uses its internal components, also known as propellant, to provide thrust to the vehicle. This differs from an aircraft that oftentimes uses the air to propel itself forward. And this is why we use rockets as spacecraft because they can still provide thrust even when there's no air. A rocket could be anything from fireworks to a model rocket to a missile or even a spacecraft. A missile is an object that is self-propelled that guides itself towards another target. There are four main types of missiles. There are surface-to-surface -surface missiles, there are surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, there are air-to-air -air missiles, and there are air-to-ground missiles. Now, to achieve all these different mission types, missiles contain four main sections. The first section is the guidance section. This contains the electronics, the seeker, the batteries, the transmitter, everything needed to get the missile from launch to its target. The next section is the warhead section, or in other words, the section that goes boom. Now the warhead can be designed all certain different types of ways. For instance, it could be a delay charge. In other words, for bunker busters, they don't blow up until they have penetrated the bunker and then they explode. That's what she said. <laughs> Other things, such as air blast bombs, are detonated before they hit the ground. So they have this sensor that detects when they reach a certain altitude, then they can explode. On other missiles, they have a proximity sensor that senses when they're close enough to the target, then they can explode to optimize their chances of hitting the target. So even if the missile misses its target, it can still hit it because it will blow up and explode all of its fragmentations beyond just hitting the missile. Most missiles will do this because it increases its chance of destroying its targets. However, there are different types of missiles that are meant to strike the target. Now these are called hit to kill missiles. But usually this involves a missile that's highly maneuverable and very precise. The next section is called the propulsion section that contains its propellant and the rocket engine for the missile. Most missiles, like I mentioned earlier, are rockets and they'll use what's known as solid rocket fuel. The reason for this is because solid rocket fuel is much more stable to store, much easier to load onto an aircraft at a moment's notice and fire at an enemy. The liquid fuel rockets, which normally require refrigeration and maintaining and do not have as long of a shelf life as solid rocket fuel. The final section of the missile is called the control section. Now these are what's known as control surfaces. We talked about in previous videos how aircraft maneuver using what's known as control surfaces. There are three basic types of control surfaces on these missiles. There are wings, fins, and canards. Now depending on the mission and the role of the missile, it may or may not have all of these. Usually you'll find more control surfaces and larger control surfaces in general in slower missiles that are meant to traverse longer distances. These long range missiles are typically referred to as cruise missiles or in other words missiles that go long ranges at slower speeds. However they're not always low speed as the Russians are developing a hypersonic cruise missile as we speak. Oftentimes the main purpose of having a cruise missile is to have a missile that's maneuverable, flies at a low altitude, and is thus low observable. And if you want to learn more about stealth technology, make sure you watch my video about the invisible airplanes. It's stealth, you cannot see it. Although a missile is much simpler in geometry than a typical aircraft, it's actually much harder to control. As I mentioned in my video talking about how aircraft maneuver in the skies, I talked about roll, pitch, and yaw. These are the three main directions that an aircraft needs to control in order to have steady level flights. 
it's primarily done by these three main control surfaces. Ailerons control the roll, the pitch is controlled by the elevators back here, and the rudders right here control the yaw. But because a missile is just a long tube, there's no way of really controlling the roll, pitch, and yaw directly. For instance, if you have a cruciform missile that has fins angled at 45 degrees, you don't have a way to directly control the pitch. So instead, what you have to do is you pitch up from all four fins at the same time, and that'll pitch your aircraft up. However, this creates unnecessary drag on the vehicle. Because of this fact, aerospace engineers have developed other methods of controlling the missile's trajectory. This is done through what's known as thrust vector control. There are six main methods of thrust vector control as shown in this diagram. But essentially the way that they work is by diverting the flow of the exhaust from the missile in different directions to move the missile in other ways. These same thrust vectoring principles have been applied to aircraft such as the F-22 and the F-35, both of which feature thrust vectoring with movable nozzles. The final and probably most difficult way to maneuver a missile is through something known as divert control or reaction jets. This is especially useful for aircraft, spacecraft, and missiles that fly extremely high altitudes because when there's no air, at that altitude or not enough air, control surfaces do absolutely nothing. So instead what they do is they use jets or gas vanes to push the aircraft in one direction to maneuver it better. One incredible example of using reaction jets or divert control is with this multiple kill vehicle, which uses divert control to literally hover in the air. And if you're familiar with control laws, you know that that would be a nightmare to try to have to program. So that is incredibly impressive. Like I mentioned earlier, missiles have four main types. Now these four main types are specifically tied to their roles. And those roles include anti-ship missiles, anti-aircraft missiles, anti-ballistic missiles, and anti-satellite missiles. Granted, there's only been a handful of those ever. Depending on the role of the missile will define what the missile trajectory looks like. In other words, the path of which the missile takes to get to its target. For instance, we talked a little bit about what a cruise missile is. It's a long range, low altitude missile that is intended to be maneuverable and especially difficult to intercept. Now this is opposed to other missiles, which can be anything from a boost glide missile. In other words, it boosts up to a high altitude and then glides into its target. Now these are especially potent for things such as surface targets. It can be anything from a ship to a military base. Now this is very similar to what's known as a ballistic missile. A ballistic missile follows a big arcing pathway all the way up, sometimes even the space, until it drops down on sometimes the other side of the world onto its target. And this is where the term ICBM or intercontinental ballistic missile comes from because it follows a ballistic or arcing pathway all the way from a different continent. Now ICBMs are the ones that we fear that North Korea would be able to launch against us. You've probably seen the maps of what North Korea can hit based on the ranges of their missiles. Now these are primarily ICBMs because they can go extremely long distances. But honestly, that is not the main concern of the US military today. We spent the better part of the Cold War building against these ICBMs with missile defense systems such as the Patriot missile that are specifically designed to intercept ICBMs. Now as a counter countermeasure, these ICBMs will often feature what's known as MIRVs or multiple independent re-entry vehicles. Or in other words, they have multiple warheads that will split off and hit all different targets at the same time. This would be a specifically difficult thing to intercept because you have to track multiple targets at the same time and fire multiple interceptors to intercept all of those entry vehicles at the same time. But like I said, those are not the ones we're worried about. What the United States is really fearing right now is what China and Russia have already developed, and that is hypersonic glide vehicles. And that's that boost glide path that we talked about earlier. So instead of going into a big arcing path all the way to another continent, this will boost up to a very high height and then drop down and kind of skim across at very, very high speeds, but it's less detectable because it's at that lower altitude like we talked about earlier. Now, not only is it at a lower altitude, but it's also moving at hypersonic speeds or speeds of over Mach 5, or five times the speed of sound. And if you wanna know more about hypersonics, make sure you watch my video talking about supersonic and hypersonic flight. So now, not only do we have a potentially 
nuclear threat moving at hypersonic speeds towards us, possibly undetected, but it's also maneuverable even when we do detect it and possibly try to intercept it, it could just maneuver out of the way. Which is why the United States has literally poured billions and billions and billions and billions and billions into developing hypersonics and anti-hypersonic research. Now, I'm no military analyst, but if you had to ask me what the number one threat to our national defense is, I would say hypersonics. Now, although hypersonic glide vehicles pose a significant threat to the United States, I would say that possibly even more threatening to us would be hypersonic cruise missiles. These missiles are able to maneuver hypersonic speeds and can maintain their low altitude throughout their entire trajectory as opposed to the hypersonic cruise vehicles, which you could potentially detect at that higher altitude shortly after launch. Now the plus side, if there is a plus side to hypersonic weapons, is that these hypersonic weapons actually have a much shorter range than their hypersonic glide vehicle counterparts. So these hypersonic cruise missiles pose the biggest threat to the United States military and other forward operating bases. So as I mentioned, hypersonics research is at an all time frenzy. And a lot of that research is going towards the propulsion systems that will maintain those hypersonic speeds. Like I mentioned, most missiles are rockets. However, this is where we start to get into a little bit of the gray area because missiles aren't always rockets. Sometimes they can be air breathing engines. Now these air breathing engines can be incredibly useful, especially in cruise missiles, because they'll be able to extend the range of that missile well beyond what it normally could with just a rocket engine. Now, in order to maintain a missile at hypersonic speeds, it has to use what's known as a scramjet, like we talked about in the previous video about supersonic jets. A scramjet uses supersonic combustion in order to maintain that aircraft speed continuously at hypersonic speeds. Now, to my knowledge, the United States doesn't actually have any hypersonic or air breathing engines on any of its missile platforms which means we have to rely on antiquated technology in order to intercept these incredibly high speed targets. So if you wanna continue learning about all those fancy aerospace buzzwords that the media likes to throw out like hypersonic without having any idea what it means, make sure you subscribe to this channel where I break down aerospace engineering principles in a way that anyone can understand them. Thank you so much for watching and Godspeed.